Okay. Well, I wish you a very wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining our session, uh, which we named Between Restrictive Drug Policing and Acceptance-Oriented Drug Care, examples from Germany, UK and the Netherlands. Um, we have discussed several aspects in uh, the plenary session uh, before, in the working group just before this session, and uh, it's always a difficulty to decide what shall we talk to you, uh, what's, what do you know already, is there anything new we can tell you, um, it's like the decision taking Olds to Athens uh, or taking coal to uh, Newcastle, we'll have a try. When we talk about drug policing, drug policies, we also discuss about criminalization, decriminalization, we talk about social problems, we talk about health problems. So uh, when we look around in Europe and other uh, developed countries and also in other not developed countries, we would say, um, we see a variety of policies, policies um, some tending to exclude people, uh, some want to have the policy of prohibition, some focus on prosecution, some say we want, we want to have abstinence orientation, others say we need an acceptance orientation. It's all about legislation, decriminalization, criminalization, and what we have heard before and what we will see now is uh, that we have very different national approaches uh, and policy guidelines in this field. You've seen it in the program book. Uh, we have had uh, the plan to give you three uh, presentations. The first is county line drug distribution, a rationalized business model. Uh, then the second is uh, the Dutch social drug policy, care instead of prohibitionism. And the last is public order partnerships for drug consumption rooms. I'm Bernard Frevel, I'll give the uh, last presentation um, in this field. I'm happy that uh, my dear colleague Jan Heinen from the Police Academy in the Netherlands is here. And now I would like to introduce to you uh, Colin Rogers, he is Professor for uh, Police Science at the Charles Sturt University in Australia and at uh, the University of South Wales in UK. As I said, I would like to introduce to you because uh, we have the problem that Colin is ill, he's got a bronchitis, isn't able to come. Uh, if he looks uh, at our presentation, if he watches it in the um, stream on the internet, uh, hello to, to him and good health. Uh, we have talked about his presentation before and uh, so I know some aspects of what he's going to talk uh, or we would be going to talk about. So uh, I'll try to give you the insights, uh, what you would uh, talk about. It's about 40 to 50 percent I get, can give you, and I won't be able to discuss uh, it in, in depth, but I hope uh, you can f take some aspects about it. It's not really about uh, drug policy, but it's about duck drug distribution, distribution in the county uh, fields of uh, UK. And uh, it's a new way of distribution, a new way of exploitation of other people. It's a thing which uh, has to be seen under the aspect of vulnerability and harm to different people. So there are traditional ways of drugs, drug distributions mainly located in the big cities like London, Birmingham, Liverpool, where there are the big hubs uh, for, for the drugs, and then they were dis uh, deployed, deployed around the uh, country with a sort of organized crime, uh, with a hierarchy of uh, people taking it from one city to the uh, countryside, to the towns, um, and there they were assembled in smaller regional hubs and sold in a wholesale uh, aspect um, and were infiltrated in the local drug scenes. But 
now we can see, or some see, a new way of um, distribution, which is called county lines. And it's uh, here defined by the National Crime Agency. County lines is a major cross-cutting issue involving drugs, violence, gangs, safeguarding, criminal and sexual exploitation, modern slavery, and missing persons. And the response to tackle it involves the police, National Crime Agency, a wide range of government departments, local government agency, and voluntary and community sector organizations. It's a term used by police and partners to refer to drug networks who use children and young people and vulnerable adults to carry out illegal activity on their behalf. So it's a new way of distribution and uh, here it's shown how it works. Um, it's a quite flexible and adaptable way of operating the methods and practices uh, to deliver the, uh, the drugs into the field and it aims to minimize the risks uh, for the big cats in uh, the drug market. And it has to do with the exploitation of vulnerable people, children, vulnerable adults, uh, as well as increasing violence. So you use the vulnerability, you use um, the people working for you and uh, have the um, drugs coming around. This has been detected in Canada and especially in UK. You can differ uh, two ways of uh, the county lines operations. You have the movement of the runners and uh, drugs to areas of operation and the delivery of drugs and money to customers by runners. So you have the runners uh, doing the uh, activities in the public sphere and uh, this is all often done with a rail network where people can be transported and they can carry around uh, the things. In 74 regions in UK, uh, there was a report on these county lines activities with the exploitation of vulnerable people. So 12% reported the exploitation of adults with physical disabilities. 61 uh, of drug users themselves, um, their dependency to the uh, drug sellers. 37, the exploitation of adults with mental health problems, and 65, with the exploitation of children. So you use these people to carry on um, the, uh, the market. And Colin tried to put it into a framework to analyze uh, this new phenomenon, and uh, he, therefore he used Ritzett's uh, aspect or theory of McDonaldization. You all know how uh, McDonald's is working, um, where you get the uh, customers do all the work or most of the work, getting the, the food to the table, cleaning up the table, putting, up, putting away uh, the waste, etc. And this way McDonald's uses to engage with the customers can be differed in four fields of action, efficiency, calculability, predictability, and control. And you can use uh, this differentiation for uh, the county lines analysis. So you have a organized assembly line production and a simplification of the product. So you have your drugs, they will have to be uh, carried on, carried around in um, in the field and you need a streamlining of the process so that it, that it goes smooth um, around um, UK. And cuckooing uh, is also an aspect where you have different hubs in the uh, area where you can put uh, the drugs for some, some days or even weeks um, and where you can uh, pick up uh, the drugs to control them. And here it's uh, again said, more efficient to get consumers to work for you, thereby reducing overheads for paying workers. Calculability. 
the speed of distribution increases and also the number of ways increases. So you have more people running for you and you have them running even faster around uh, the area, very often in, um, in the railway, uh, on the railway. You can distribute a bit easier with the modern technology of the mobile phones, so you have an accurate distribution in the specific location and uh, the one who runs the hubs can better calculate what to do, who is going to pick up the things. And this line of uh, runners, hubs, makes it difficult to find the one who is running the, the business. Predictability. Um, you just concentrate on some drugs. You don't have all in your uh, pockets, not the synthetic drugs, the cannabis, the cocaine, the heroin, etc. But you concentrate on your products and you calculate how you want them to be distributed. Um, this makes you able to ensure the consistency and the predictability in terms of uh, customers. And it allows uh, to have an overview over the process as a whole. And this makes it also more easy to follow the line uh, to get the money together and control. Um, the last aspect of the McDonaldization theory is you get the customer work for you and you can control what they do, how they do, and what they are, uh, how they are doing it. And therefore, you take vulnerable people to undertake supply operations at the street levels. So addicted drug users are paid and controlled uh, through the excess of drugs. You often use men and women, often vulnerable, through learning difficulties or mental health problems, which can be manipulated easier than uh, people with knowledge about everything. And that they do it is controlled by violence and weapons, uh, which is reported by the National Crime Agency. Another aspect of control is that of debt bondage, so you keep the uh, people dependent to you and the debts are inflated through the supply of drugs. So what can happen when you organize your drug uh, supply on this way? Uh, you have an aggressive marketing technique, uh, giving out free samples, making the people uh, depending on you. Um, which can also be seen in the growing market, the growing opium production in the last years. Um, the changes in the stigma about crack, now an acceptable product to, to use, is one aspect to be seen. And what we also see is that the police were not able to follow uh, this problem up to now. So they have difficulties to targeting this drug dealing. While it's unclear if county lines had driven the increase in crack use, the findings support existing evidence about the expansion of county lines activity in the recent years. Colin says uh, county lines is an efficient way of organizing drug distribution because it's founded upon rationality, simplicity and effectiveness. And he says, we need to understand how it works, uh, what the model makes it unique, and how we can uh, control it with the criminal justice agency. The police has uh, seen the problem now, they are working on it, and um, they said, we need to have a multi-agency working group. This was. Uh, uh, build up 2016. They build up a new legislation for the police and national crime agency to apply to civil courts for order to compel mobile network operators to close down the phone networks involved in drug dealing. There are some publications given to the practitioners. Uh, there is a series of events to raise awareness and in 2017 an action plan was followed. So, it is 
an interagency um, approach to deal with this problem. This is uh, a recent uh, article on BBC, 21st of May, um, and it says that police arrested uh, 586 people in county lines cracked down, so they made raids, they followed up uh, the line, and uh, in this operation, this uh, was the article about it, 500 men and 86 women were arrested in raids in Norfolk, Suffolk, Sh uh, Cheshire, Bedfordshire and other areas. And in these uh, groups uh, detected and found out 519 vulnerable adults and 336 children were identified and they needed uh, support and help. Three, 30 people were identified as potential victims of slavery and human trafficking. Guns were seized, swords, machetes, axe, knives, samurai swords and a crossbow. Well, uh, you can do it also with the health angels. Uh, and drugs were uh, found in worth street value of more than 176,000. The uh, conclusion of the National Crime Agency is tackling county lines drug, drug gangs is a national law enforcement priority and we'll see how this result of the activities in May will continue in the last years. If you have any question, write to Colin Rogers. Thank you. But now, uh, you get an original presentation. Um, it's about uh, the Dutch drug policy. And Jan Heinen is a former police officer in Amsterdam, studied law and now is a lecturer for law at the Police Academy of the Netherlands in Appledorn. Here we are. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. I think, I think you did an excellent job to represent our colleague, uh, Colin uh, Rogers. Um, my presentation is about the, drug, the Dutch drug uh, policy. And um, first, um, I will say something about the way I built up my presentation. Uh, first, introductions, then the facts and policy, then uh, to concentrate on the criminal word of Sindru. Sindru is the synthet synthetic drugs, and the Dutch, the Dutch government and synthetic drugs. Why the Netherlands? Why are we a key player in the criminal world, uh, world of uh, uh, Sindru? and the strategic approach uh, of narcotics from the Dutch National Police and some words about other measures. Laws, laws and regulations. Um, our Dutch Opium Act is made for public health and welfare. And the minister who is responsible is not the Minister of Security and Justice, but the Minister of the Health uh, Department. And he or she is advised by health, narcotic and toxicology, toxicology specialist. Uh, I want to apologize a little bit for my English. I'm not a native speaker, but I will uh, do my, I will try and do my utmost. Uh, and in our country, we have the difference between hard and soft drugs. Two types of narcotics. We have hard drugs, and it's on list one of the Dutch uh, Opium Act, and the soft drugs on list two of the Dutch Opium Act. Some examples, hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, amphetamine, LSD, MD, XTC, and many others, and the soft drugs, cannabis, hash, marijuana, Dutch wheat, and other substances. The policy of the Dutch government is that drug users are no criminals but patients. So we have a point of view that there is uh, uh, social accountability versus individual accountability. 
unless drug users show criminal behavior because of they have to finance the daily necessary portion hard drugs. And in our country, there are about 11,000 hard drug users. Those hard drug users are addicted to cocaine and heroin. This group is getting older and the number stays the same. The government started several years ago a controlled project to distribute free heroin to 100 heroin users in Rotterdam, Amsterdam and uh, The Hague. But nowadays, a lot of youngsters aged between 14 and 21 use use ecstasy, amphetamine and cocaine. And there is close cooperation between police, public health organizations and the local government. And it's an integral, integral approach of the health, criminal and disturbance problems. The Dutch government handles a toleration policy at soft drugs like cannabis. The use and possession less than five grams a person of soft drugs is an offense. Uh, it's not legalized, but it is tolerated and will not be prosecuted. And the import, the nursery and trade in soft drugs is an offense and will be prosecuted. And the Dutch government published national toleration rules for coffee shops. As I said before, it is, it's not a legalization, eh, but uh, they like this, eh, that they tolerate uh, the coffee shops and under some conditions. Eh, we call it the AHOJG criteria in the Dutch language. And when you translate it, it's uh, no advertising, no hard drugs in your coffee shop, use and selling, no disturbance eh, in, the, in the surrounding of the uh, uh, coffee shop. There's no public order uh, problems. And you're not allowed to, to go in a coffee shop uh, under the age of 18 years. And it's not allowed to sell more than five, five grams of soft drugs a person uh, a day. And no more merchandise than 500 grams in your coffee shop. And no selling near schools and only selling to residents. When you perpetrate these this rules, uh, then the, the, your coffee shop will be closed. The nursery of cannabis is police dismissal. If there are no more than five cannabis plants, the police destroys these plants without prosecuting. If there are more than five plants, they will also be destroyed and there will be a prosecuting. There are 365 uh, 65,000 users not addicted of cannabis products in the Netherlands. And only a few number of the users needs professional help. The Netherlands has long been a major player on the world stage of Sindru, synthetic drugs. And the Dutch, the Dutch Sindru is because of excellent quality in great amounts all over the world. In 2017, the Sindru revenue is at least 19 billion euros. For instance, eh, when you look at the costs to produce XCC, one pill, the producing of one pill of XCC is only 20 euro cents. The street value in the Netherlands, two till five euros. Over here in Sweden, 13 euros. And in Australia, in Australia 20 euros. Violence and liquidation due to drug criminality. Example given, at least 10 mistaken killings, there's the wrong persons, the last year. Violence is used if necessary, and plenty of people are prepared to act as an executioner. Contract killings are a regular occurrence. And of course, the problems with the OMGs, the motor clubs. And Five, uh, the environmental, uh, environmental pollution. And the principal ingredients for Sindru, the precursors, are imported from China. Here's some examples of environment pollution. And the, se the second photo, uh, it's a fire. It's, it's in the middle of the, in the, in the center of a city near 
houses of people who, who live over there. Some aspects of the criminal world and Sindhru. They have a specialization of roles. Individual specific roles, transporters, buyers, technic technic technicians, no monopoly positions in the world of criminal, criminal world of Sindhru. Strong local and international networks, and also a strong innovative cap capability. Drugs and precursors are regularly renewed to circumvent uh, prohibitions without compromising the quality of the syndrome. And also the so-called underground uh, banking. Uh, we do, they earn a lot of money. You saw it on the, on the, on the slide, uh, tw nearly 20 billion of euros. But we hardly know where the cash flow goes and um, so it's very, uh, very difficult uh, to, uh, to discover and, and, and also the problem from uh, money laundering. And they have a collective intelligence and organized uh, energy. Uh, I want to read, um, to quote a, a story of the organized uh, energy. So, the quote, we have heard that one well-known group were planning something the next Thursday. It was a big deal, worth more than a million. We wanted to nab them. Two arrest teams and two support teams were drummed up to provide assistance. A helicopter took the air and the mobile unit was on standby. But at the designated time for the deal, nothing happened. We waited and waited. We had observers all over the place and made inquiries all around, but we found nothing. No sooner had we called the operation off than we heard what had happened. The key player had caught himself blind drunk the night before and was out for the count until well into the afternoon. But we received strong signals that the deal had been moved to the Friday evening but I couldn't get enough men together at such short notice. We had to let it go. And also the problem of the violence used uh, in the criminal world, world in Sindhu. Then some aspects of the government and synthetic drugs. The Dutch government has a later reaction with legal reaction related to other countries. Sometimes the Dutch government acts against Sindhu under international pressure. Uh, example given, our Prime Minister Wim Kok was visiting the States and he had a chat with Clinton and Clinton complained about the, the, the huge amount of drugs was entering the States. And so he came back and he slammed his fist on the table and at that very moment the, the, the units to fight against the drugs were uh, uh, increased, there became more units. Also, the fact that the criminal investigation was in disarray uh, because a, a lot of uh, techniques and tactical uh, things to, to fight against drugs were beyond uh, the rule of law and it paralyzed uh, the uh, criminal investigations for a number of years. Also the complexity of government enforcement and the realization of the Net Dutch National Police. At least 15 separate units spread across five ministries at fights against ecstasy. Also, the mild sentences climate. This of the 26 member states of the European Union, uh, we have the, the lowest score for imposing and implement, implementing penalties for the supply of drugs, cannabis, syndrome, and cocaine. And also, uh, the hitching a right for criminals on the legal econo economy. We are the 15th economy in the world. Uh, we have a well-developed financial system 
uh, a strategic location, uh, the gateway of Europe, and an excellent infrastructure, road, land, water, and rail. And also the bias to other priorities. Uh, for instance, um, the exchange of information. Uh, I, I, I told before, uh, China, our precursors are important from China, but the, uh, the, the Dutch government is reluctant uh, in ex exchanging um, information with China because uh, uh, the people over there uh, are, uh, yeah, uh, are sentenced to death. So the Dutch government wants to, to exchange the information because of uh, that. Why the Netherlands as key player on synthetic drugs? Some circumstances. We have a good price quality ratio of the Dutch syndrome. The low risk of the ring, ringleaders getting caught. Uh, relatively low penalties in comparison with Australia, China and Indonesia. As a result, top criminals prefer to buy Sindhu from Dutch criminals and the emphasis of the discriminant on harm reduction and the tolerant attitude towards drug use and the production of it. And also, of course, the free movement of goods and persons within the Schengen area and the country's permissive attitude towards drugs. But due to new insights, use of drugs by youngsters and the damage for the brain uh, because of the component TRC. THC. The blind spot that criminals earn a lot of money, money laundering, uh, the threat of public administration, civil servants, for instance mayors, and the mixing up from the upper world, upper, upper world with the underworld. And the users of drugs maintain the trade of drugs, supply and demand, and they are part of the criminal chain. So the police strategy to realize a robust and effective task. Performance, execution, and fight against drug crime. Barrier, the effects of drug crime to protect our rule of law. How? Four pillars. Combining and joining internal forces. So from local to nodal orientation. When you have a local orientation, uh, only look in your own precinct and that's it. But a nodal orientation is you are, uh, you are uh, surveying the, the internet and where do people, goods and, uh, and, and so on, uh, meet uh, uh, at harbors, at uh, airports and, and so on. To improve the international scope, uh, the collaboration with other countries to fight mondial drugs criminality about the pillar about drugs, drug economics, yeah. centralizing the drug issue and eliminate barriers. Example given, uh, and, 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 and criminal investigation in, in Holland last maximum six months. So after six months, it's, it's, it's over and now what are we gonna do? To increase intelligence and analysis. Focus on demantling and take down criminal networks and on money and havings. So to decrease the amount of vulnerable people to join criminal networks so that they join the illegal chance economy and prevention. And of course, the resilient rule of law. So give proportional and more weight for investigation. So when you compare it with the interest on human rights, uh, economical, and judicial interest, uh, we have to, to, to balance it, uh, that it's uh, uh, more, uh, the, 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 the equity, that there is as, as more um, attention for human rights and as more for, uh, uh, for instance, the rule of law. Other measures are possible, stricter and severe penalties, banning OMGs by court. Uh, last month, two weeks ago, the uh, OMG, the Hells Angels, uh, 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 were banned by, uh, by court, by the judge. Uh, legalizing soft drugs in Europe, for instance. 
increasing education, labor, and care initiatives, and increasing the budget for the approach of drug criminality in the criminal justice chain. And the sixth one, I want to show you a short film. Well, it's It's about a new measure of the prosecutors in our country. It's about scent recognition. Because uh, when you have an, uh, an, an XTC lab, then you, you, can, you can smell the, the odor in, in the environment. It's like a, like a, a nice, uh, a nice uh, scent. So there's a new perfume on the market. Een van de belangrijkste signalen dat er mogelijk een ecstasy lab bij je in de buurt zit is de geur. Om iedereen daar alert op te maken heeft het openbaar ministerie... Een van de belangrijkste signalen dat er mogelijk een ecstasy lab bij je in de buurt zit is de geur. Om iedereen daar alert... Ja. Nee, het is niet op de scherm. Het is op mijn laptop, het is niet op de... There it is. It's from the prosecutors. Office. Dat er mogelijk een ecstasy lab bij je in de buurt zit is de geur. Om iedereen daar alert op te maken heeft het openbaar ministerie die geur laten namaken. Nou, welkom. Dit is het uh, laboratorium van Smartnose. Hier uh, maken wij onze geuren. Hier is het uh, parfumflesje met de ecstasy geur. Wauw, heel gaaf. Antoinette Doedens en Carla Hofstee zijn allebei officier van justitie. Zij zetten een grote campagne op om het parfum te verspreiden. Nou, de geur is het allerbelangrijkste onderdeel waaraan je een ecstasy lab zou kunnen herkennen. En daarom willen we die geur graag over heel Nederland verspreiden, zodat iedereen weet waarop die moet letten. Maar hoe ruikt de geur dan? Ja, voor mij echt uh, de anijs komt meteen je neus binnen en... Uh... Daarna wordt hij ook wel wat, uh, wat zuriger, maar dat anijs, dat is wel echt uh, wat uh, herkenbaar is aan deze geur. Er zijn diverse geuren aan de Ecstasy Lab. Wij hebben de meest kenmerkende gekozen, de anijsachtige geur. En daarmee kun je al een heleboel geuren uh, van een Ecstasy Lab onderkennen. Dit parfum is onderdeel van de campagne genaamd Daar zit een luchtje aan. Daarin wordt duidelijk gemaakt wat je moet doen als je vermoedt dat er ergens een Ecstasy Lab zit. Op het moment dat je ergens loopt en je ruikt die uh, hele herkenbare geur, dan is het de bedoeling dat je ofwel de politie belt, ofwel dat als je anoniem iets wil melden, dat je contact opneemt met meld, mist dat anoniem. Het parfum zal te ruiken zijn bij verschillende politiebureaus en daarna verder verspreid worden. Ook worden er speciale geurkaarten gemaakt. Als mensen de kaart pakken en ze gaan er overheen wrijven, dan komt de parfum vrij en dat is een volledig veilige, veilige geur. Kijk op om.nl slash daar zit een luchtje aan voor meer informatie. We stop this. Sorry for the... Can someone help me, please? It's not going well. Is it this one? 
No, it's this one. This one. And this one. Okay. No, I will. I it, it, it will, I will not manage it. Uh, sorry for the uh, for this problem. Uh, the the film the, the the film was about the scent eh, when the public uh, walk around a, a ecstasy lab and you smell the the the, the odor the scent of anise. Then you can call the. Uh, then you can call the uh, uh, police. So uh, the literature and the sources for my presentation. Um, oh, here it is. The strategic cost drugs of the Dutch National Police from 2018, and the Netherlands and synthetic drugs, an inconvenient truth from Peter Tops, from Valkenhoef, Edward van der Torre, and van Spijk, and also a recently newspaper. Uh, NSA Handelsblad on the 14th of May 2019. Thank you for your attention, and when there are any questions or discussion, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Are there any questions related to this uh, presentation? Not yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to give you some insights in the public order partnerships for drug consumption rooms. Um, this is uh, about the safer use, it's about harm reduction and how it's done within a smaller city, uh, or bigger city, Münster in North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, the research is done within two case studies in two different cities about um, these uh, facilities, how they work, what they want to do. It's just a, a tiny and a limited element of harm reduction policy in the field of the drug policy. Um, and it's not representative for whole Germany because there are only 24 of these facilities in whole Germany. Just putting it uh, in, the, in the structure, I'll talk about the drug policy in, in Germany uh, and the changes that were done in the last years. I'll then uh, point out some aspects of the uh, concept of accepted, acceptance-oriented drug policy and then I'll introduce to you the idea, the concept, the doing uh, of safe use rooms, the law aspects and the public order partnership within. All countries face uh, these problems with the drug use and drug dealings and uh, as we discussed before, um, we have different attitudes towards uh, the several drugs. So we have alcohol, nicotine and medicines which are often legal and accepted uh, within the society. We have cannabis, hash um, and cocaine, especially for the rich ones, uh, they are declared uh, as illegal but conditionally accepted as a consume in our society. And we have other drugs where most of uh, the European countries say that it's uh, illegal and not accepted like heroin, crack, crystal meth. And we have a broad spectrum of policies and law dealing with this. Um, very sharp uh, said it would be a, a sort of zero tolerance with a condemnation of drug use and dealing and in Germany uh, we have strict law but between leniency and strictness uh, changing 
over there is my dear friend uh, Anders Green from Bro. He visited our university in, in Germany and talked to the police students and uh, asked them to, to prioritize uh, different uh, fields of, of crime. And he was a bit uh, surprised that the drug crime was ranked very low, while it would be ranked very high uh, in Sweden. So we have our different attitudes. And what we can see in Germany that we have a, a changing uh, drug policy. While we can see a more robust and uh, yeah, with efforts against consume in the field of legal uh, drugs like alcohol and nicotine, we have media campaigns about it, we have, have had several uh, law acts, uh, non-smoker protection acts, we have the ban on alcohol in some parts of the public space and during events. So we are going more strict in some ways of the legal uh, drugs, while with a focus on the illegal drugs, we can see a shift going away from crime and criminalization concentrating on drug use, not drug dealing, um, when there is not only the aspect of crime, but more important, the aspect on social and individual and public health aspects. And these uh, individual health aspects are uh, important when it's going about the, um, the addicts and uh, their situation. Addicts are under pressure. Um, they have a higher rate of illnesses, several uh, illnesses from getting a cold, uh, but also to the very difficult uh, illnesses like HIV and hepatitis infection. Uh, in the need for drugs, they have impoverishment, homelessness, debts often uh, against the uh, drug dealers, we, we face social marginalization, we face social relegation, we have criminalization in different ways of uh, um, acts like target of being target of control, detention, prosecution, because of drug consume, possession and dealing. And uh, we also have this uh, big amount of direct and indirect crime in pursuit of drug acquisition. And we see, especially uh, with the girls, or young women, but also uh, men, the uh, aspects of prostitution. So when the addicts are under pressure, we have to think about what can we do with their situation, what can we do with their vulnerability, what can we do uh, with it. And uh, the accepted oriented drug policy says we don't bother uh, about the reasons why someone is uh, taking drugs. It can be uh, the conscious consumer, they want to have it for pleasure, uh, relaxing in the evening, uh, smoking a little pipe. Uh, it's about self-medication, uh, hush against um, um, Schmerzen. Okay. Uh, or it's a way of lifestyle when you have your cocaine. Or you can see it uh, as a way of illness where you need adequate forms of aid and therapy. So it's about the self-definition of the individual takes precedence in our form of drug work and not the cozy, we know what's best for you attitude with its patronizing style of caring. So the accepted oriented drug care says we want to help people, we want to support their self-help activities. And uh, we want to help them to be safer in the use, to uh, work or to inject uh, with the clean needles, with clean syringes. It's about the health environment um, when you consume. It's about harm reduction and that you want to have a low threshold to get access to drug services. This is focused on the individual, but also the uh, acceptance-oriented drug care and policy focuses the society, the public, when they want to have a lobbying for human uh, drug policy and they um, intend to reduce stress for the public around drug scenes. 
So, taking a picture of a drug addict he can consume in the public sphere, in the public space. He is uh, sitting in a park in the house entrance in a dirty surrounding, uh, boiling up the heroin, uh, setting the syringe, and he's very vulnerable in this situation because he can be attacked afterwards when other uh, people want to have a look whether he has some more uh, heroin in his pockets or he has some money in his pockets. He can be a victim of hate crime, etc. So, is it better to have this way of putting the syringe in the public space or in a clean environment? This is uh, the drug consumption room in Bochum. So, you see, it's uh, very clean and not, not cozy, but it's uh, hygienic. The idea of uh, the drug consumption rooms, it's about a low threshold um, to get in contact with the addicts. So, they want to have a hygienic controlled application of drugs and survival help. So, there are always people around who can give first aid, call the emergency team, uh, can help in this uh, field when you have an overdose. It's about reducing the risks of infection, it's about uh, risk awareness of drug use, so the social workers, uh, the, uh, first, uh, the, the drug consultants help uh, the people, make them aware about the risks, try to uh, reduce health risks and to improve treatment preparedness. You always know, uh, you all know that uh, drugs need uh, often need uh, treatment, but they refuse it. So, talking about the problems uh, should help the, the, to prepare the, um, the treatment. It increases uh, the rescue chances in case of drug use inflicted emergency, it promotes availment for further intermittent help, and it reduces stress for the public following drug-related behavior. So, this looks good. But, there's always a but, we have learned in uh, the presentation before, drug consumption rooms cannot resolve drug scenes or minimize drug acquisition crime. It cannot influence uh, the risks of consumption of adulterated or drawn out drugs, because you have to bring your own drug in, uh, to this um, premises. And it, it exists in a precarious law situation. So, if you have been in the presentation before, uh, you learned from Letizia that uh, Germany has a law against use and possession uh, of drugs, but we have uh, the possibility to uh, not to prosecute when it's just for the individual personal use, as we have heard from the Netherlands, with about five gram for personal use of hashish or something. This is uh, the map of uh, Germany, and you can see that uh, it's about the northwestern part uh, where the drug consumption rooms are located, and also the capital, Berlin. Most of the uh, drug consumption rooms are in the so-called Ruhrgebiet, a high-density area from, from Dortmund, Essen, Oberhausen, Duisburg, several cities uh, around with major uh, drug problems. And we have uh, Frankfurt, which was also mentioned in a presentation before. So, in these 24 uh, steady and mobile drug consumption rooms, you can use uh, your drugs, which you have to bring around yourself. There is always a law. We are talking about Germany. So, there is a Verordnung, a decree, uh, about uh, drug consumption rooms, and it says it's about health, survival, and coming of coming of drugs of the addicts, and it's about uh, health risks, securing the survival of addicts, increased treatment willingness, breakout of addiction, uh, improve access to addiction therapy and medical help, reduce strain of the public caused by consumption-related behavior. 
So that is the task, the aim uh, given by the uh, Parliament and the Ministry. And so what's on offer when you want to have such a drug consumption room? We have a drug consumption room in the narrow sense, what you uh, saw in the, in the first picture or in the second picture. Uh, there you can uh, use your drugs intravenous, inhalative or oral, um, and there are restricted uh, elements with this. There's no dealing within the premises. You just can't uh, use the drug consumption room if you are registered and if you are full age. Uh, and it's reduced to the uh, regular opening hours. It's about 10 in the morning till 6 in the evening. Sometimes or also at the weekends. They offer acute medical support, so all the uh, staff uh, working in this drug consumption room is trained in first aid, especially related to um, effects of um, drug use. You have a syringe and needle exchange. You have uh, a support, how to use uh, your uh, drugs in a less harmful way, safer use practice. Um, you are informed what to do with the uh, used syringes and needles. Um, they offer practical everyday help. This can be the coffee uh, you can have uh, with a social worker or someone uh, from the staff. It is uh, the usage of a shower. It's the usage of um, a washing machine because we, also, we often see that the Drug addicts are homeless, have difficulties organizing the everyday uh, challenges. So uh, these opportunities are given here. And it's guidance, uh, a guidance towards pursuing help like care, therapy, and counseling. That's in the narrow sense, but they offer uh, some things more like psychosocial care and advice external case-based assisted living, so they try uh, to, to get the people in proper housing, in uh, groups uh, where they have access to uh, social workers. They have special programs working with uh, migrants, they have special programs working with women, and they do a lot of public relation uh, to inform the public, the civil society, um, also the merchants, the entrepreneurs around the scenes, uh, what's happening there. And they do uh, collect, uh, the, the collection of used and discarded syringes around the premises because there are always other addicts uh, to, they, to they, they consume in the public space and then um, the uh, staff of the drug consumption room collects these. To make it more clear, this is uh, the situation uh, around the main station of Münster. Here is uh, the main station. Münster is a city of about 310,000 inhabitants. Uh, of them are 50,000 students, uh, a lot of public service, uh, um, people's public servants. But we also have a drug scene. And this drug scene uh, lives, lived at this Bremer Platz. It's, uh, park behind the station, so the city center is over here. Here is uh, the Bremer Platz with the drug scene and the alcohol scene. And it was a very stable situation. So we had the drug scene and the alcohol scene. Uh, everybody knew about it. The police had uh, the opportunity to have several, I, don't, <laughs> I won't show them, um, flats where they controlled um, the scene um, and organized the dealing. Uh, no, they didn't organize that. They looked how it is organized. And over here, there is uh, the drug consumption room, Indro Institute for Acceptance-Oriented and Rational Drug Policy. So uh, the drugs, uh, the addicts could walk over to uh, the Indro and use it. Some facts and figures. This is uh, a picture of this very small drug consumption room we have in Münster, but it is used 
by about 150 people uh, a day with about 60 to 70 consumptions. Meaning, in 2018, 16,421 consumptions, oral, intravenous, inhalative, uh, could be counted. Of these 16,421 consumptions, there were 46 drug emergencies and nine life-threatening. But because the staff is trained in this situation, uh, the survival of the addicts was possible. They collected around the premises 2,500 used syringes, and uh, what they see is uh, that the pop population of the drug consumer, uh, customers in this uh, drug consumption room, is getting older, and that the uh, amount of migrants is a bit bigger or, uh, or growing. 16,421 uh, consumptions in the drug consume, uh, consumption room say it's 16,421 consumptions not taking place in the uh, uh, public space. And it's a duty to have a public order partnership in this uh, field. So when you want to run a public order partnership, you have to organize um, this, this partnership and uh, work together with a public prosecutor, with the police, with the psychiatric clinic, also based in Münster, uh, the German railway. Uh, Indro is uh, the welfare organization running this uh, consumption room. Uh, they work together with the Merchants Association, the municipality with different uh, apartments like the social department, public order, health department for children, juveniles and families, the park authorities, um, the city planners, the waste disposal service. Um, you have this, the quarter management, the hostel for the homeless, uh, street work, uh, railway mission run by uh, the churches, school in the neighborhood of the scene, the property and business community. So you want to organize communication, coordination and collaboration of these different actors. And they have regular meetings um, where they discuss the safety and security problems. They get the numbers of uh, the indro uh, about the consumption. They got the numbers from the police about uh, crime related to the drug scene. So they can have a basis for their plannings uh, of the activities. They have the communication between the stakeholders. The public order partnership uh, in Münster says we want firstly to have the harm reduction, the mediation of the conflict around the scene, the Bremer Platz, you saw that there are also residential houses and um, entrepreneurs, uh, local uh, shops around. They want the, to improve the collaboration of the authorities, they want to reduce the stress of the public and the uh, risk of the, uh, for the public done by harassment, begging, theft, robberies, antisocial behavior. The situation was uh, quite clear, um, but there are changes at the moment. You remember the picture of the, um, the park behind the, the railway station, but uh, the gentrification of this area uh, goes on, so they want to rebuild or new build uh, new flats and uh, shops around it, so the drug scene is under pressure and it's moving. So we had a very stabi uh, stable uh, situation for uh, many years and now the drug scene is moving, moving to other places, want to know where they can stay, what, what's happening with their park. Um, and this is hyped by a local newspaper, so it's growing feelings of insecurity around the drug scene because they are not predictable as they were before. So we have new conflicts in the use of the public space in the context of modernization and gentrification in this new station. My conclusion is the acceptance-oriented drug policy can reduce the social and health problems of drug consumers. It's uh, an offer 
or it, it offers diverse chances for harm reduction and care, as well for the public as for the addicts. And the public order partnership moderates the conflict and allows agreed approach, including the help-oriented strategies for the addicts, but it also linked to hard policing with control, raids, arrests of dealers, fight against antisocial behavior. So it's, as I said in the beginning, a tiny and limited element uh, for harm reduction. It can't solve uh, the, the drug problem around uh, the Bremer Platz or in the other cities where it is, but uh, I think it's an important way uh, to help the people who have facing serious problems and they get help to get on with their life, to get treatment, to get support, to get a better way of living and that's worth it. Thank you. So now it's a chance to ask about the drug consumption rooms and the policy and Germany related to drug consumption rooms. Uh, thanks for the presentation. What well, I wonder is, if you're looking for the crystal ball, what will happen in Germany in the following years? Like you, as we mentioned a couple of times, we've got the, uh, the sort of <clears throat> the medical aspects that they are patients, not criminals. But at the same time, you see at the bottom line there, hard policing with control raids, arrests of dealers, etc. Will there be like 50 drug rooms within 10 years, or will they be closed down so we've got none? How do you see at the future? Uh, are you asking about the situation in Münster, or are you asking the, the drug policy in Germany? Um, you can actually there are two questions. So begin with Münster, and then if you look at all of Germany, please. Yeah. So I think in Münster and the other cities where we have drug consumption rooms, uh, there is an ongoing work uh, on harm reduction, on uh, information rationalization of the, the policies. So uh, they've got a quite strong uh, position in this discourse, but they are under pressure. Um, I uh, talked to the uh, president of the drug consumption room and he says, well, I don't know what's going to happen. We don't know where the drug scene is moving and uh, when they move uncontrolled and we don't have access to them because the way from one uh, place they, they stay to the indro is too long, they won't, won't take it. So there is the risk of uh, spreading around dislocation of the, the drug scenes. And this uh, can be fueled by uh, the media discourse that uh, there are more risks. Uh, we saw that um, the drug scene, the drug dealing, moved over to the front of the uh, main station, not staying behind, um, and that this caused a lot of problems, feelings of insecurity, um, complaints about, uh, of the public uh, at the police that they didn't act. So they increased the rates, the control, um, etc. So at the moment in Münster, there is a difficult situation. I think it's uh, the same in other uh, cities where we have drug uh, consumption rooms. There is still an unclear law situation for these uh, premises. And um, what we see in other uh, areas in, in uh, Germany is uh, that it's yeah, between linears, linearness um, and uh, strictness. So uh, there is still a call for uh, decriminalization of hashish uh, cannabis products, um, but an ongoing discussion about more uh, activities against hard crimes. So it's an ongoing discussion. I can't uh, predict uh, what's happening, uh, but uh, the, the long tradition of we don't know how we want to deal with it. 
still being strict uh, to, to let it go uh, will continue, I think. Over here. Ruth. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I mean, you know what we are doing also in Switzerland, and we have a long, longer experience, I think, uh, because the first uh, consumption room was opened in 86 in a very quiet, conservative city. Um, no, my question is more uh, about this program for migrants and for women. What What is the special con uh, content of this program? I mean, the most vulnerable people are probably also the migrants because a lot of them will not be, uh, I think, with permit or so. Uh, and uh, how, how can you manage a special program for women? Are they special opening time or what is, is the team different? Um, I don't have insight uh, in, in depth, but um, the, the causes for um, these special programs for migrants is that uh, migrants, these migrants, don't uh, trust the, the public services as other uh, people do, and even less than uh, addicts normally do. Uh, so they need more care, they need more information about uh, social help, uh, financing, access to, uh, to better housing, etc. So they try to get access to them to give information about the dealings. Um, and the, the population is changing a lot of uh, Eastern European um, people are more in the alcohol scene while um, the uh, southeastern people often take uh, the hard drugs so they want to uh, find out about the, the problems and to uh, to get them to better treatment or at least treatment so it's about accessibility uh, mainly That's it. There are no more questions. So I have a little present for you for, for ending. A quarter of an hour time uh, enjoyed in the sun. Thank you for joining our panel and goodbye. <laughs>